Reset is our series, January 2020, hey? Beginning of a new year, uh, of a new decade. And I want to focus on how do you recover your life? How, how do you live a life where you are moving forward? You're not looking backwards or going backwards or not staying where you are, but moving forward. You know, one of the things that kills progress and moving forward is when you're stuck in and not handling anxiety or worry or doubt or fear. If you think about those emotions of, uh, and they're very real, fear, doubt, unbelief, uh, worry, anxiety, they're, they're, su they're such internally crippling emotions. And some of us struggle with it. I think every human being, uh, no one here in this place is anxiety free or worry free or anxiety free or, 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 or free from, from fear. These are a part of the human condition and we all struggle with this. And sadly, when, when people have childhood traumas, uh, we tend to find, and certainly I'm not a doctor or psychiatrist, whatever, but if just from my pastoral experience, people that have had severe childhood traumas tend to struggle with those areas uh, a lot more. And, um, but all of us struggle with them, and if they become too, too major in our life, we get unwell, emotionally unwell, relationally unwell. And t t for me, to, to be able to recover your life, you've got to learn how to deal with anxiety and fear and doubt and unbelief and, and to experience, experience Jesus' real presence and peace. Not just theoretically that he's the Prince of Peace, but that he is my Prince of Peace. That he can neutralize these destructive emotions and fill me with a sense of tranquility and inner peace that I know that he lives within me and I'm allowing, as we sang, his presence to neutralize those things and to help us to live above them. Uh, so uh, look at these couple of verses. Let me give you a couple of verses before I focus on the main verse. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. He says, when you have my peace, because your hearts are going to be stilled and your fears are going to be dealt with. I'm going to keep your heart safe. I'm going to keep your inner life at peace. I'm going to be able, you're going to have a power to control your thought life because an out of control thought life causes all kinds of internal disruption and, and that causes behaviours that, that uh, um, are not life giving. Look what Isaiah said, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast, whose thought life is under control because they trust in you. Notice he gives the answer. And my life verse that I've had for many, many years, in fact, two of my great life, scripture life passages would be the Lord's Prayer and this statement in Philippians 4, that probably that Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer, and Philippians 4, verses 4 to 6 would be two passages and uh, what Jesus said, the model prayer, and what the Apostle Paul said of how to live an anxiety-free life have helped hundreds of millions of people. In fact, commentators say the Philippians 4 passage is, is probably the most used passage that has provided comfort and encouragement and strength to hundreds of millions of people over the years. And uh, the great promise that he gives, let me give you the promise before I look at verses 4 to 6 in, in uh, Philippians 4, 7 says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding beyond comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds. The word in the Greek is not so much your mind, but your thoughts. So when I was checking out the original Greek language, actually, it's your thoughts, because thoughts can go all over the place. And uh, God says, my peace, the peace of God, which transcends our understanding beyond comprehension. It's like, that's why Jesus said it's not as the world gives. The world's peace is so arbitrary and so relative and so fleeting. 
but his peace is eternal and transformative and, and it'll guard your hearts and your minds and that word guard is another magnificent Greek word and the Greek scholars here will check me out on this is the word brabio and in Colossians when he says let the peace of Christ rule in your heart is the word furio and the rule in your heart is let it be an umpire so the peace of God when it's disrupted guides you like the umpire of the Holy Spirit has blown his whistle going, whoa, die, don't make that decision. Hey, Sam, no, 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 no. It's like all of a sudden you're disturbed because the presence of God within you says, hey, I'm speaking. He goes, no, no, think differently. So Paul says, let the peace of Christ rule or umpire, be the umpire. So as umpires blow the, the whistle in a footy match, oh, something's gone wrong here. Correction. So that's the peace of God can be an umpire, but here it's to be a fortress. It's to be your Windsor Castle. For those of you that have been to Windsor Castle, you ever been there? You've been to Windsor Castle. I was there when the Queen was there. Her flag was up. She didn't come out to meet Kathy and I, but she was there. It was good. But I, I went to Windsor Castle. I couldn't believe it. I did a bit of the history of it. And when William the Conqueror in 1066, the Battle of Hastings, remember, you learned that? When he conquered and, and, and uh, London, he thought, well, how do I protect them from the Vikings and that? So he knew the River Thames from the east is a natural protection. They've got forts along there, so you try and invade. But the west, if they come the other way, so he found this hilly area and he built the first fortress. And, you know, they've been building on that ever since. It's, it's the oldest living, functioning castle in the world but you've got to see it you're going the walls are like like I, I want to exaggerate but I reckon they seemed like 15 to 20 feet thick so and then massive and there's walls within walls and then there's this massive moat all around full of crocodiles and anacondas and 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 deadly snakes and spikes and all that. No, I'm just exaggerating but but uh, you could imagine that thing being filled with water. So you, you, you can't, it's almost, it's almost impenetrable. Now we know today with rockets and bombs, it's different, but in that era. So he is saying, all hell may be breaking loose around about you. There might be devils screaming in your ear. There may be circumstances out of control. There may be people that are wild and doing stuff. And, and in the 830 service, someone spoke to me about they read me a letter that somebody wrote to them of just a, oh, you know, really. I said, Bill, how would you handle this? So I wrote my office, I said, well, look, this is what my immediate response is like. Talk about a horrible letter by somebody who's really wounded and hurt and is just lashing out at a family member. Like, it's a beauty. And, uh, but that can just disturb you, you know, like, what, how the heck am I going to handle this? I don't want World War Three, And uh, how do I neutralise this? All hell could be breaking loose. And it says, when the peace of God that transcends, I think, will be a fortress in your heart. No one can get in and Jesus won't leave. Fortress, garrison, garrisoning you. It's a fantastic promise. Whereas the other one in Colossians 3 is the guidance one that says, okay, well, in making decisions, you've got to rely upon the Holy Spirit who just may be going ding, 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 ding. You know, you're going down Freddie Road and the lights go, whoop, you better stop or the train's going to hit you. It's like the warning light, the umpire. So one to guide you. This is now to protect you, to fortress you. This is a powerful promise. It's a wonderful promise. Um, and Paul is talking about a divine, supernatural peace of God that the Holy Spirit brings it's the natural overflow of the Spirit of God in our lives once we have made our peace with God through placing our faith in Jesus Christ the Prince of Peace and so this is the world doesn't understand this those who are outside of Christ cannot experience this so one has to make their peace with God before they can experience the peace of God. And if you're still on that journey and you haven't yet made your peace with God, I would appeal to you, be reconciled to him. Put your trust in him. 
Jesus who loves you. Jesus who died for you on a cross. Jesus who carried your sin. Jesus who removed the barriers between a perfect God and an imperfect humanity. When we place our trust in him, forgiveness comes into our life. We're reconciled to a loving heavenly dad and we see him smiling at us. Heaven's our home. That's where we're going. Heaven's our home. When you experience peace with God, you're born again. The Spirit of God comes to live within you and you have this, ah, I have peace with God. And you can't initiate it. The Prince of Peace does that. All that we have to do is is just unconditionally surrender. It's not like a peace treaty. Well, God, I'll make peace with you if and but. No, 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 no. It's like... It's like President Roosevelt in the Second World War at the conference in Casablanca. He blew them all away. And he said with his cigarette, he goes, we're going for the unconditional surrender of that monster Hitler. No conditions. Never again will Germany wreak war upon the European continent. Never again will the militarists of Japan or the fascists of Italy wreak such destruction. And all the generals go, oh, we've never done that before. Even General Eisenhower, who had to lead D-Day, go, man, but they weren't thinking ahead. Roosevelt was thinking ahead. He's saying, no conditions. I'm going to create a United Nations. I'm going to try and and neutralise this terrible destruction of war. You know, we've never had a world war since then. Unconditional surrender. When the Nazis, the fascists, the militarists surrendered, they just said, there's no deal. Do with us what you want. And they did. To become a Christian, you can't make a deal with God. It's the unconditional surrender. We're at war with him. And when we say, Lord, I see you, and it's not a thing of force or pressure. You see love in action on a cross. Christ loving us. The only response when the Holy Spirit moves on you is, okay, yeah, I surrender. I give over to you. And then you have peace with God. You're saved forever. Then the Spirit of God in you can impart to you the peace of God that is so transformative. It becomes a powerful witness to those who don't know him. I think of the turmoil that our fellow Aussies are going through now. Like, I mean, it's been terrible, the bushfires. Shocking. And, um, you know, and, and my prayers, and we prayed last week, about this was, uh, I mean, you know, like people are making a big deal over three or four people saying not some very nice things to the Prime Minister. That just reveals the turmoil, the anxiety, the fear, the trouble that people are in. It doesn't make it right, but, you know, people, it, to me it was a reflection of, of uh, people who are not at peace who are troubled, they've lost everything. They might have lost loved ones, they've lost their property. And if they haven't been insured, you think of the levels of fear, anxiety, pressure, they're thinking ahead in the future. So my prayer over our nation has been, Lord, somehow, somehow, may this help them to see they need to make their peace with you so that the peace of Christ can can help them. And so as Christians, let's believe for that, 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 that the churches and that people of goodwill, that people will open their heart to say, you know, God is good in spite of evil, in spite of suffering, that, that, that I'm not going to lose, I'm not going to get jaded in life. And we pray that people will experience salvation in Christ. And so to experience this transformative peace, Paul makes it very clear. It's interesting with this promise. In fact, in, in Philippians, the whole chapter four, it's an interesting chapter. The whole of chapter 4, there's three promises. And you can see it where it goes, and the peace of God. A little bit later, it goes, and the God of peace. A little bit later, it goes, and my God will supply. There's three magnificent promises. But inherent in those promises are some basic life attitudes that a born-again Christian needs to embrace to tap into the promise. Okay? So the reason why this is not working in, in, some of my, in some Christians' hearts and lives is because they're not embracing what Paul just says in verses 4 to 6. And, and, and this, is, this has been a, a life passage for me. And so let me just cover these, what he says. First of all, a rejoicing heart. 
a positive attitude towards oneself. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say it again. Rejoice. It's like, it's like he's saying, guys, I know you're going through hell. I know it's difficult. But I'm telling you, rejoice in the Lord. It's a decision. Choose to rejoice in God. I'm going to say it again. Rejoice. Doesn't say, doesn't, he doesn't say, wait till you feel like rejoicing. In other words, you can see the, the, the cup half empty or you can see it half full. And if you see it half full, you're thankful for what you've got, not what you don't have. You live a contented life because you're not forever envying and are jealous of other people. You're thankful for who you are in Christ and you're appreciative of the manifold gifts that he has given to us. And you think of Paul, the suffering he went through. Now, the Philippians, the Philippians must have known this. Like When Paul went there in Philippi, now Philippi is just north of Thessalonica, just a little bit further across, and it's the city that was named well, Alexander the Great's father was Philip of Macedon and, and they named it after him and, uh, and it became a Roman colony where Caesar and Pompey the great generals the, the men who fought in their wars they would actually give like I think 20 30 acres of land so they could become farmers so it actually became uh, ex-servicemen that were there in, in that whole area and uh, so the, the, the local people the local Greek people there were a little bit intimidated because the colonial power, the Roman authorities, were not just there in Rome, they were right there. So it was a Roman colony, a principal city. So there's a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. When Paul went there to preach and to share, he meets a woman called Lydia. He leads her to Christ. There's a whole pile of stuff. Anyway, what happened was the local magistrates had him arrested, beaten up and thrown in jail. And put in stocks. And I've been in that prison in Philippi. They've dug it up. It's amazing. I think that's a little hole. I'm a pretty big guy. But even if you're a shorty, it's like, how do you fit in there? But you put your hands in stocks and your feet in stocks. When you reach my age, when you bend over and stay in that position for five minutes, you know what happens? You can't get up. You click, 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 click. Okay. You know, what a lot, you know, it's like you young people, you know, what's he talking about? You will experience it one day, don't you worry. <laughs> but you imagine in stocks, and you would think Paul would be cussing. You rotten guys, I've come here. You know what he and Silas do? They start singing. They get Laura out there with the guitar. Come on, lead us in some songs. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Jesus is God. He is King. He died on a cross. He's coming again. The Holy Spirit's my comfort. All these songs. And the jailer, the Roman jailer, he's listening to all this. You know what happens? He gets converted through the singing. Because the songs are all about Jesus and who he is and what he's done for us. He gets converted. So when Paul says to them, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say it, rejoice, they would have been reminded of what, how he behaved in a circumstance that was vicious. It was cruel, it was unfair, unjust. In fact, when he get out, got out and he goes and sees the magistrate, you know what he does? He says, uh, by the way, Mr. Judge, I'm a Roman citizen. Well, they nearly freaked out. You cannot treat a Roman citizen like that. You're in trouble with big C, Caesar. You can't treat a Roman citizen. And a Roman citizen could make an appeal straight to Caesar's court in Rome, which Paul did later. So they packed death. <laughs> and so Paul then, he said, okay, guys. He basically confronted them so they would treat the Christians better. Paul had, was wise and smart. But in the prison, he rejoiced. And though he's growing older and he's suffering, and, and I'm sure his sufferings had taken their toll on him. Yet for all of that, he had not lost his joy in Christ. There is enough in Christ, folks, to cause joy to break out of us, even in the worst of circumstances. There really is. And uh, one of the strongest affirmations of faith in the whole of Scripture would have to be Habakkuk. Now, he's an Old Testament prophet. And Habakkuk, three chapters, it's not much. Like Habakkuk's really... He's snaky about the, the Jewish people being so evil and nasty and hurting God. And he, and he says, God, how are you going to deal with them? Because I'll deal with them because I'm going to send the Babylonians to fix them up. And he goes, the Babylonians? Yeah, but they're more evil than the Jews. Oh, don't worry, I'll fix them up as well. 
So he's saying, so he's God saying, I'm sovereign. I'm not the cause of evil. I'm not the cause of sin. I'm sovereign. I will use even Nebuchadnezzar and, and Napalassa, the, the kings, to outwork my will. And so Habakkuk's going, wow. And then, and then this magnificent statement as he's really suffering because of the terrible injustices that were occurring. You have to read three little chapters. And he says this in Habakkuk chapter 3. Though the fig tree does not bud, <laughs> and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, and this is where so much of Australia is experiencing this right now. Right now, even in Adelaide Hills, all those vineyards, half of Kangaroo Island burnt to death. Gone. He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Notice, in the Lord. I'm not going to rejoice in my circumstances. They're of the devil. Sin is of the devil. Sickness is of the devil. The devil's very real. Jesus said that in the Lord's prayer. He says, pray, lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So sin and evil and darkness is very real. And so we don't rejoice because of the evil. We rejoice in God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. Notice that. He is sovereign. He's the boss. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread the heights. Wow, isn't that fantastic? Just that verse may be one that you need to memorize. You know what he's saying? God is your sovereign over every aspect of your life. God is your strength. Don't trust in yourself, but in his keeping power. God gives you sure-footed confidence when the road of life is slippery. God enables you to go further than you could on your own. That's what Habakkuk is saying. Being a rejoicing Christian causes us to focus on what we have in Christ and not on what we don't have. You don't know what 2020 is going to bring. I didn't know what 2019 was going to bring. Being struck down with illness halfway through the year? What? I'm Superman. I haven't been in the hospital for 50 plus years. I'm strong and fit and well. Bang. You just think, wow. I don't wish that upon anyone. But I tell you what. It makes you come back to say, well, what is this, the basis of my faith? Right. What is the basis of my faith? Is it, I've got to understand, and it's helped me to understand, I live in a world that's cursed with sin and sickness and evil and injustice and pain. And I'm just so thankful I have a God who is sovereign, who is good, who knows all things, and I trust in him. And he says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Be positive. A positive attitude to, towards you. In other words, it's yourself. If you don't get this right, how can the peace of God come upon you? You'll block the peace of God from flowing. Secondly, a considerate disposition, a positive attitude towards others. He says, let your gentleness... And the Greek word here, gentleness is not quite enough. It's the word, it's forbearance or consideration. Be evident to all. Because Jesus has been so good to you, he has accepted you in your sinful state. Then he forgave you by grace. And now he's changing your character to reflect him. Paul says, hey, develop a considerate disposition towards all people. You see, your temperament is set. I'm looking at my little granddaughter, little Billy, little darling, and, and you can see little traits. Well, that's a Vasilakis gene. That's a Gardnerva gene. That's an Evans gene. That's a Hawkins gene. You know, we sort of joke. We say, oh, what are they like? You know, by the time they're three or four, temperament set. And uh, pre- I, I got saved when I was 17. My temperament hasn't changed. I know what I was. What changes is your character. Your basic, God doesn't change your nature. Even, like I said, childhood traumas and and issues that that are growth restricting. When Christ comes within, it's his love, 
It's his peace, it's his joy, it's his patience, it's his kindness, it's his gentleness, it's his faithfulness, it's his self-control, it's his goodness that overtakes. So I am growing in character, becoming more like Christ. More like, so therefore, the older you become, the more considerate you become. The more forbearing you become. You carry other people's burdens because you know the Lord has carried your burdens. The Greek word epigis is an ethical term. He says, this, let your gentleness or your, your, your uh, forbearance be evident to all. It's an ethical term and it can be translated. In other words, it's behavior. Gentleness, forbearance, moderation, graciousness, considerate. I love this one. Sweet reasonableness. The stronger, the longer you become a Christian, the more reasonable you should become. So you grumpy old men, if you are becoming less reasonable, you need to repent of that. And say, Jesus, help me to become a sweeter, nicer, and get rid of that grumpy demon out of you in Jesus' name, eh? Sorry, guys, I'm speaking to myself here. One commentator said this about this passage. He goes, fair-mindedness, he calls it, fair-mindedness. The attitude of a person who is charitable towards other people's faults and merciful in their judgment of other people's failings because they take their whole situation into reckoning. Wow. You see, Jesus accepted you before you repented. He didn't say, well, you'd be a good boy and a good girl, then I might forgive you. He says, I accept you as you are. I will forgive you. He goes, now the changing process will occur. And then when we become Christians, we become very religious and very self-righteous. And we say, well, I want them to change first before I accept them. No, 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 you accept people and have a forbearing attitude. Paul says, let your, evident, let, let your forbearance be made known to everyone. An uncomplaining readiness to accept others as they are. Hey, look, when you undergo hospital treatment, you have all kinds of nurses and doctors. And look, I, I, I just can't fault them. They've been fantastic. But there was, um, there was one person that was just got up my nose a little bit, you know, just... So anyway, I just I said a few things. And, and uh, afterwards, I felt terrible. I thought, gosh. So the next time I saw her, I spoke to her and I said, look, you know, last week when I talk, I said, I, I, was, I, I wasn't really fair. I said, I'm, I'm really sorry for, for, what, for what I said to you. She goes, oh, Mr. Vassilakis, no, no, that, you were fine. Because the other men I deal with are 100 times worse than you. <laughs> That's how I interpreted what she said. And I said, no, no. I said, look, I said, I'm sorry. I said, I, I just, you were doing good. I said, I was just a bit, you know, irritable. And I, said, I shouldn't have said that. And I just fulsomely apologised. Why? I mean, I'm paying the money for the care. I'm, the, I'm a private patient. I expect this and expect that. No, 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 no. A considerate person. He's not a weak person. But he understands, you know what? I accept that person for who they are. And it doesn't matter. You've got to let your character come out. And if you sin relationally and if you're rude and if you are irritable and that, you face up to it and you say, you know what, Lord, I know this is not... This is not considerate because Paul says the Lord is near in this passage. The Lord is near. Because let your, let your consideration be evident. The Lord is near. In other words, people in commentators say, is that he's near, come back. No, no, no. He's actually saying the Lord is near you. He's in you. Yeah. Talk to Jesus. So, oh, Lord, I slipped up there. I shouldn't have said that. You know, so you say something and you want to catch that word before it goes, ah, it was too late. It's caused devastation. What you can do, the Lord say, now just make it right. Let your consideration, let your considerateness be evident to all. Because what he's saying here is, if you are breaking relationships, if you're a relationship wrecker, you're crude, rude and revolting, under pressure, how the heck can the Holy Spirit impart to you the peace of God? First of all, you're going to need to repent of some things. He did say, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm, you're near me. I'm not actually listening to you. So Paul is saying this promise cannot be realized and outworked unless you're practicing. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say it, rejoice. Let your forbearance be evident to all. The Lord is near. 
And then thirdly, he says here, I love this. You've got to develop a worry-free thought life, <laughs> a worry-free mind, having a positive attitude towards circumstances. Now, this used to frustrate me. When I came across this verse many decades ago, I'm thinking, what? So in my side of the family, my mother's side, we're worry warts. Okay, we're like worry warts. We, we got slightly obsessive. It's all my mum's fault, the genes. I'm in our national exec meeting. This is a true story. I'm in a national exec meeting, and we're in our office. Now, when I do the curtains in my office, when I put them up, I have them all about three inches from the top, all the same. And whoever did it that morning, it must have been Peter Gillard or someone. Not. One's there, one's... I'm thinking, and I'm running this meeting of the national leaders of the movement. I'm thinking, those curtains are driving me crazy. I couldn't... So in the middle of the night, I got up and I... And Ian Miller bursts out, finally! Thank you, Bill. They've driven me crazy for the last hour. And then he says, guys, just need to be aware, I'm this close to being diagnosed with OCD. <laughs> Obsessive compulsive disorder. He's worse than me. Philip Bryce, he's over the top. <laughs> Pastor Phil has, the same, has had the same breakfast for 40 years. Exactly the same. How boring. <laughs> he's not here, so I can tease him. Philip, forgive me. Hey, we all have worries, a worry-free mind. Do not be, Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. Give me a break. I used to say, how can you say this, Paul? We all have worries and fears and anxieties about so many things. You have a child. Wonderful gift. And then you, you develop a new series of, of levels of worry over a cough, over this, over that. I mean, like, I wouldn't let anyone touch Stephanie. I'd have sterilising equipment to wash your hands first, please. Put a mask on. Don't you, uh, like I, I just was like germs and me don't mix. So all of a sudden, uh, you become you know it was family members want to touch that. I said, don't touch, just look. <laughs> I got better with the second one, and by the fourth one, I said, ah, do what you want with her. You think your kids get married, they're off your hands. Nah, you never stop parenting. Then you have grandchildren. I've got seven now, and I pray for them every day. I think of them every day, I pray for them as part of my prayer. Because if I don't, I'll let worry of what could go wrong. What could go wrong? So, oh Lord, just, just pray, I, I neutralize my anxiety, and this is what Paul says, so, and then, the worries of the churches. The bigger the church, the bigger the headaches. The more churches, <laughs> the more headaches. A denomination. That's ah, uh, like, okay, so the daily burden of, of carrying and, and helping people and pastors and leaders in what they're doing. Um, uh, when he says, have no anxiety about anything, surely this is an impossible ideal. Surely no one can live a totally anxiety-free life. Yes, you can. If you are intimately connected to your loving heavenly dad and you're assured that he is totally good and you are assured that he is totally all-powerful and you are assured that he is everywhere at the same place. God's omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. And the, he gives us the antidote. How do you have a worry-free mind? How do you not be anxious about anything? And then he says, the only way is prayer. Have a look at this next one. A prayerful defendant life, having a positive attitude towards God. And he says, but in every situation, in every situation, by prayer. What's he saying? Talk to God. But I'm not in the place of prayer. Doesn't matter. You're in the mode of prayer. Prayer should be as natural as breathing. How long can you hold your breath for? Not very long. To sustain your physical life, you breathe and it's automatic. To sustain your spiritual life, you require to be shooting prayers up to God all the time. Nehemiah is my favorite. He's on the wall and he's doing his stuff and see something and all of a sudden, oh Lord, oh Jesus, I need your help. He doesn't stop doing his work. Shooting his prayers up all the time. He's a great example. 
shooting prayers up. It's anxiety, and anxiety comes. What do you do? Talk to God about it. As soon as the anxiety comes, the worry, the fear, just talk to God. Say, God, I'm just feeling this. I'm anxious about this little grandchild of mine, or I'm anxious about this pastor. I'll just talk to God. Say, God, but you're good, and you're all powerful. And then he says, and petition. And you can throw in the word request. If you look at the Greek words, they're fantastic. I wish I could do a study for you, but you check it. He's actually saying petitioning means being specific. What do you want me to do for you? As Jesus said to the man, he says, what do you want me to do? So you've got to ask God. God's not a machine. He's a person. And sometimes it's good to write out your requests. Be specific. Be particular. Lord, this is my worry. And, and I'm talking to you, and, and I want this worry lifted from me. And Lord, this is what I'm requesting from you. Be specific. Be particular. Don't be vague. Petitioning. And notice, with thanksgiving. Ephkaristia, the word. And that's the language of faith. Yes. It's the language of faith. Because if you're praying, and if you're full of anxiety, and, and some prayers fuel the anxiety. Some prayers fuel the anxiety. They bounce back from the ceiling. Why? Not because God doesn't hear. It's because there's no faith dimension. There's no faith dimension. And the faith dimension says, God, you are good. God, you are great. God, you are sovereign. God, you know all things. You're not the cause of sin. You're not the cause of sickness. But you know all things. I put my trust in you. Like Habakkuk says, there's nothing going right. Everything's gone kaput. But yet I will rejoice in you. So my anxiety, when it comes, I just talk to God. And then I specifically ask for help. I may even write it down. I write my prayers down in my Bible. So I've just, I've just put it down. So a little comment. Just put down, okay. In code form, so not everyone can see it. Just like, okay, this is what I'm believing for. With thanksgiving. The language of faith. Rejoicing. He is encouraging us, folks. This is my, how I want to conclude. He, he is encouraging us to see this as the great antidote for anxiety. And uh, this is so important. So, so important. He's encouraging us to bring all our worries, all our fears, all your anxieties, to the only one who can neutralize them because we can leave them in his safe hands, his all-powerful hands. The only answer when overwhelmed by worry and fear and anxiety is to look away from ourselves and our limited resources and to focus our, our sight towards our resourceful God who loves to meet our needs, even those seemingly impossible situations. And he gives us he promises, let's go back to the promise now, verse 7. And, and, when you see a conjunction like and, like in verse 8, when he says, and the God of peace, lead, read verse 9 rather, then read verse 8. And my God will meet all your needs, verse 19. Look at the preceding parts, because Paul is sharing his heart. It's very personal. So if you want the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, to guard your heart, to be a fortress, you've got to embrace these. You've got to embrace them. And the interesting thing is, and this is where I see so many people who make a decision for Jesus, and if they don't get this on the inside, they don't last. They just don't last. They make an emotional decision. They make a circumstantial decision. Jesus in the parable of the sower, Matthew 3. You know what he says? One in four make it. One in four make it. The person who rejoices emotionally and doesn't put his roots down in the word of God and get a good understanding of who God is won't make it. The person who, who lets the, the worries of life, the cares of this world still dominate, won't make it. Jesus says they won't make it, yet they've made a decision. The person who is, has not dealt with the issues of materialism, the deceitfulness of wealth, the deceitfulness of the material, they won't make it. If biblically 
our relationship with God is not rooted and grounded in sound understanding of who God is. He does not promise he'll give you what you ask for. If you think, as people say to me, oh, well, I prayed and God didn't answer me. I say, excuse me? God didn't answer you? Of course he answered you. If you pray in faith, he will answer. He didn't answer the way that you thought he would answer. Why should he? Do you think he's some celestial Santa Claus? That is some computer in the sky, pressing a certain thing. Oh, God, I have this need. And then automatic dispenser of, of... No. Then we wouldn't have relationship with him. He'd just be there to serve us. We would become God. You thought of that? He is God. He is our loving heavenly dad. He is sovereign. His delays are not his denials. Sometimes he says no, and he gives no reason, and we won't know until we get to heaven. Then everything becomes unveiled. So if our faith is based on a faulty view of who God is, we won't last the distance. And the saddest thing in my life as a pastor is to see people who just won't make it. And you see it, you think, they're just not going to last. Some trial will come, some illness, some circumstance, some difficulty. Like I noticed this, this gentleman who read me the thing and, and he said, Pastor Bill, what would you do with this? And I thought, he's going to make it because already he's made the decision not to react to this terrible letter. And I said, this is what I would do. It was my instinctive response because that's exactly what I thought. I said, I said pour water on fire, neutralise it. And then it's over to that person to have to deal with their attitude towards you said, you've done the most you can. Just say sorry. I apologise. And neutralise it. But their faith is strong and clear and they know what the right thing to do is. And, and if it's not, that's why this passage is so, so good. Can we stand together? I want to lead you in prayer. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, Rejoice. Let your considerateness, your forbearance be made known to all people because the Lord is at hand. Don't have any anxiety about anything, but guys, neutralize it. The antidote is you talk to your loving heavenly dad. You petition him with a specific request and then make sure you fill it with faith and confidence. And that faith and confidence is that you know who he is. He is totally good. He cannot do evil. He is sovereign over your life, every aspect of your life. Inject faith and thanksgiving, rejoice. And it says, I will give you my presence and peace. He promises that peace that will keep your heart, fortress your heart. All hell may be breaking loose around about you. And that may happen in 2020 for some of you. But God will be your fortress. He'll be your strength. Loving Father, we thank you for this amazing passage of Scripture. I thank you, Lord, for it being such a life verse for me over many decades and particularly the last six months. Thank you, Lord, that you've proved yourself to be ever faithful, ever kind, ever loving, ever good, so sovereign so beautiful, so wonderful that we have you as our loving heavenly dad in heaven and yet you're near us through Jesus and the Holy Spirit and we thank you that you haven't left us defenceless or to be alone but your presence is in us and Lord I pray that every one of my brothers and sisters will experience the efficacy, the power the effectiveness of this amazing promise and the peace of God that transcends all our understanding and all our misunderstandings. That, Lord, you will keep our hearts, our inner life, our emotional centre, our thought life tranquil and peaceful. That you will be our garrison, protecting us. That you will never leave us or forsake us. And nothing can take us down because we're already in victory through Jesus Christ. So Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' wonderful name. Thank you, Lord.